A few days ago, Gordon Murray Automotive introduced us to the T50S. Now this is a largely redesigned and improved version of the T50 uh, aimed at track specific use. Now that means that a lot of the external bodywork has been changed in terms of we've got a lot of aero add-ons and things like that. And in this video, we're gonna discuss a little bit of the aerodynamic layout of the car. Now I'm still planning on doing another video discussing the, the fan layout that's common to both this and the T50, because uh, I do have quite a few comments surrounding that. Uh, but this video is gonna focus primarily on the non-fan related aerodynamics around the car, because there weren't many of those on the vanilla T50, but on the T50S, there's a quite a few things that we can talk about. Just as a brief introduction, we need to mention their downforce figures that they're claiming. Now, I'd like to thank GMA for actually providing reasonable downforce figures here, compared to some of the more ridiculous claims that we've seen from other manufacturers recently. Now, what they've claimed is 1500 kilos at high speed. Uh, the speed is unspecified, but I did a bit more digging and I found that uh, another claim is, is that at 281 kilometers per hour, the car can drive upside down. And that tells us that it's producing its weight in downforce at 281 kilometers an hour. Now, the car's uh, mass is, is quite low. Uh, they took a lot out of it compared to even the stock T50. It's 852 kilos. Now, some quick back calculations on that tells me that the SCZ uh, or downforce coefficient is around 2.2 to 2.4, depending on the weight of the driver. This is quite a reasonable number and is about what I'd expect given the design elements on this car, the tunnels and things like that. Back calculating from that, the quote of 1500 kilos seems to be taking place at around 360 to 370 Ks now, which is quite a high speed to be quoting downforce at, but the key thing is, is that the ultimate downforce claim that they're making isn't actually ridiculous or absurd. It's quite believable. And also their claim that they initially hit 1900 kilos of downforce at their target speed, and then they've had to back it off to 1500 kilos to make the car a bit more drivable. That's also quite believable because I do believe that they could hit 1900 kilos at 360 Ks an hour on this car. I think that's an achievable aero target. The other thing I want to talk about for context is the mass of the car and the implications on aerodynamics. Now, Aerodynamics and, and overall car mass are, are very closely linked in terms of performance. The lighter the car is, the more downforce has an effect. So when you go and you make a really, really light car, like this car here, which is incredibly light, as you add downforce, your downforce is worth a heap. So if you had a car that weighed twice as much, you'd need twice as much downforce to achieve the same result. So by taking the mass down to the, the bare minimum, getting it down below 900 kilos, it means that every bit of downforce they put on it is gonna be very noticeable. So props to them for keeping the car really light. It's gonna make any downforce they do make quite a bit more effective. With the numbers out of the way, let's get into some of the analysis of what's going on with the aerodynamics around the car. Now the images I'll be using from this analysis, I pulled a lot of screenshots from the, the release video that, that they did for the car. Um, and one of the things I want to sort of disclose on this is, is that obviously the car that they presented, the model itself, is not the actual physical car and it's missing a lot of detailing. As such, I think it's worth noting that some of these details could change on the final model. Uh, some things that tell me that this is the case and this is not the actual car are things like at the front, you'll notice that there's no cooling inlets right at the front, like it's all just blanked off and the same at the back, all the cooling is blanked off. Uh, so obviously there's no internals in there. If you have a look at some shots from the side, uh, like over here, you can see that there's actually no material sort of in and under the car. The under tray isn't fitted. So there's, it's probably a largely hollow shell that we're looking at here. There's probably not a huge amount of stuff in this particular shot. But anyway, I imagine that a lot of the external details are gonna remain similar and there's gonna be similar behavior to how everything goes. Uh, so we can discuss that anyway, and it should give us a good indication of what's going on with the car. I think another thing that's worth bearing in mind is that this is not a full aero or pure aero car. There is very much a, a few styling elements being incorporated into it in terms of, of getting the aesthetics that they wanted and stuff like that. One thing that instantly comes to mind is the rear wing. And they say in the video itself that it's a throwback to, to the old uh, Brabham cars. And the thing is, is that like items like this, while it's, it's a bit of nostalgia and it looks kind of cool, uh, aerodynamically, if you were just going for pure aero, you wouldn't do this. You'd do a straight leading edge and stuff like that because we don't have a transonic speed on this car. We're not going as fast as an aircraft. So you go for that straight leading edge. Um, so there's just a few little details on the car like that where clearly 
they were still very obsessed with getting the styling right, um, not just the, the aerodynamics. Uh, so just bear that in mind for a few little bits. It seems like there is a strong focus on, on getting aerodynamic performance, but there's still a lot of styling involved. Okay, we're gonna follow our usual format here, which is starting off with the overall aero architecture, then the, the cooling setup, and then finally the front to back detailed aero analysis. Now the aerodynamic setup on this car is a, a moderately conventional setup with a, a few different little tweaks on it. Uh, so what we've got is we've got a large front splitter, which is presumably gonna have some front diffusers underneath it, some side canards along here, Pretty standard two element rear wing. And looking from the rear, we've got a nice extraction region to help air out from under the front splitter. And then as we go to the back, we have a slightly less conventional setup, which is some huge uh, rear tunnels uh, going on either side of the sort of center transmission area and engine area. And then we have a less than conventional fan in the center. In terms of cooling, uh, it's hard to tell exactly how the cooling ducts are being managed through here because there's, there's quite a few interesting things going on. Um, now, we've obviously got an inlet in the center here and then two sort of side inlets there and there. Uh, now, the question is as to whether these are for cooling flows or just straight aerodynamic flows. Um, you could potentially be feeding a front wing through under here. Um, the downforce figures suggest that that is probably unlikely that it's probably not feeding a front wing. What I has to guess is those side ducts might be going to, to the brake ducts, could be a potential place that they're going. Um, and then the center is perhaps feeding a cooler. The thing is, is that we then need to think about where the air is exiting from those spots. Uh, so any sort of center cooler, there's no outlet if you have a look. There's maybe a, a, a small little gap here, uh, but certainly nothing too sizable. So in terms of if we had a cooler sitting about here in the car, we could be seeing air in here, and then ideally we would have it pass up and out on this vent here. That would be really nice because we want to keep the cooling air up and away from the floor, but potentially it could be going down and through the floor, um, which is a bit suboptimal, but honestly I, I can't tell from these images where they're routing it. Um, another option that could be occurring here is that the air is just going through here and then actually feeding a tea tray or a splitter um, that's hidden under the front here. So there could be a tea tray sort of on the, the floor here, kind of like an F1 car uh, that could be generating vortices for the floor. Uh, again, unsure if this is the case, but this could be one potential solution that's going on in there. There's three knacker ducts on the hood. We've got one here, one here, and one there. Um, now those could be used for a number of different cooling purposes. I'd hazard a guess that at least one of them is gonna be a cabin air intake. Um, perhaps the two side ones, or it could be the center one. Um, one of these is going to be a cabin air intake to feed cool air to the cabin, because that can get quite hot on track. Um, and that's what these guys are probably used for. So you could potentially have uh, the cabin cooling air fed from the center and the two side ones going to brake ducts, or you could have all three going to the cabin. Either way, these are all intakes here. Up on the roof, we have the engine air intake. Uh, and you'll notice that it's, it's actually separated. It's up off the roof deck, so it's not touching the roof dead on. Um, this indicates that it, it is getting clear of the boundary layer. So along the roof, if you imagine we have our windscreen going into our roof like that, there'll be a boundary layer growth along the, the roof line itself, along the surface of slow moving air. So anything that we ingest from that is going to be uh, low on energy. Uh, so what we can do is we can instead go and put the scoop up high, up here, and that's our scoop there. And then that way we get only nice clean air instead of getting all this boundary layer air being ingested in there. So it's quite a nice thing having this off the roof. You pay a slight drag penalty, but you're gonna get nothing but high quality airflow to your engine, which means you'll get an engine power boost. Further back, we have these big uh, side cooling inlets there. So we've got some there, and then it looks like we've got another smaller set on the top deck. I'd hazard a guess that these are gonna be what's feeding the main engine coolers. Uh, it's probably a reasonable shot. Potentially there'll be some cooling through the, the frontal portion, but also like these, these side and rear ones are probably what's gonna feed the majority of, of the air into the cooling circuits for the engine. And if you look at the back, uh, I'd hazard a guess that these are just closed up for now, but you can see that this grill portion here and here is probably gonna be opened up and turned into a radiator grill. Uh, so all that air that's being sucked in through 
those side inlets and those top inlets that's going to go through go through some coolers and then get vented out the back somewhere there also looks like there's some gills along the side of the window here and at the back of the roof here as well as a few little slots in the center um, these are probably venting more engine bay air directly. There's probably not a whole lot of direct cooling air coming from there in terms of going through a cooler, but the, the hot air from the engine bay is, is still going to make its way out those. Um, so that's a summary of the overall cooling architecture for this car. So let's get into the, the detailed aero analysis. Now the base car here uh, obviously is a very smooth and sleek and simple design and that's actually quite good with respect to it's a good aero platform because you start with something that's really smooth and clean you have minimal losses and then when you add parts to it uh, you then don't have to worry so much about anything bad going on um, one of the things with the the aerodynamics in this car is that even as they've added parts to it they've obviously been trying to keep a very clean and minimalist aesthetic on the car uh, and while it means they could have added a bit more detail here and there to, to improve the aerodynamics slightly, I think they've hit a reasonably good compromise uh, between uh, aerodynamic design in terms of, of an engineering sense and aesthetic design in terms of, of making sure the car looks good and achieves the, the target vision. Now, uh, in terms of the front splitter, uh, this style is a style that you see on a lot of GT3 or LMP style cars. Um, basically what we've got is we've got a lowered outer portion and a raised center section. So the center goes up and then it drops down, something like that. Um, now the raised center section has two things uh, that it does. Uh, one is that it decreases your pitch sensitivity a little bit because what happens is that you have different portions of the splitter at different heights with respect to the ground. So as the car's going up and down, uh, depending on how bumps happen or, or even just how the downforce compresses the suspension, the different parts of the splitter will be reaching different points in ground effect. So typically you have a curve of downforce versus ride height. So what we've got is, is that if this curve here is um, this bottom axis is your ride height and this, this vertical axis is your downforce. Uh, what happens is that as the ride height gets lower and lower and lower, the downforce increases of an object and once it gets too low, it starts to drop off again. Now, what this means is that if you have one profile here on that, the center portion that's, that's got a relatively high ride height, and then one portion here on the lower, on the outboard portion, which has a, a comparatively lower ride height, it means that as these move up and down, uh, they sort of slide around this curve. And this means you can get a more consistent uh, level of front end downforce. So that's one advantage of, of running a multiple height or, or raised center front splitter. The other is, is that you can encourage a little bit more mass flow through to the center of the car. Um, now this depends on what treatment they're using behind the car. If they're using a tea tray or a splitter in the center of the car, like I discussed earlier, uh, then this could be one potential way of feeding mass flow to there if you are planning on taking this center air here and directing it to a cooler and up and out, as opposed to sending it through the, uh, the bodywork and underneath the floor. The other advantage going low on the outboard portions is that you want to try and introduce as much loss as possible in front of the front tire. Uh, and if you keep these outboard portions low, you can get that loss in front of the front tire. Uh, it just means that you have less front tire squirt to worry about. Uh, and then you can still have good clean flow through the center. And it also means you can run a, a comparatively gentle or low front diffuser on the outboard portion, but still get a decent amount of downforce. The canards are an interesting choice. Um, a lot of this I think might be a bit of a styling exercise there, uh, but it, it still would perform aerodynamic function. The way that you would look at it is that they've decoupled the vortex shedding from the downforce generation of the device, or more importantly, they've allowed you to, to have a certain level of pressure on the winglets and then that's driving the vortex shedding instead of a, a traditional canard which drives the vortex around to the suction side. So if you have a look uh, on top of these winglets, we'll have a high pressure region there and there, uh, and it will be comparatively low pressure on the outside of this vertical winglet. So what will happen is the airflow will go around that way and it will spin up a vortex down the side of the car. Uh, now these vortices can help manage the wheel wakes, they can help extract air from the cooling ducts and the brake, and they can also help redirect air to the, um, to the size of the floor further downstream and just generally improve your airflow management down the car. So anyway, I, I still think that the, they've gone for a bit of a, a styling-based solution here because obviously if you're going for pure aero, 
you wouldn't do the same sort of uh, setup where you block off the suction side of the wing, um, but they've, they've managed to still get the intent of a pure air solution. The other thing that they have managed to integrate into this is this little air curtain section here. So what they've got is they've got this little air gap here, and then they've got this little vertical uh, flap. This can basically help manage the airflow around the front bumper and as it comes into the tires. One thing to note out of this is, is that if you were going for outright downforce here, uh, there are some more aggressive things you can do. Like you can go and instead of, of trying to keep everything going inwards around the bumper, which is quite drag efficient, what you can actually do is you can go and make a vein that will kick the air outboards. So the vein expands that way. Um, and then you combine that with a front diffuser that's got some aggressive lateral expansion and your air will get kicked out really hard to the side and that will generate a lot of front downforce. Uh, but it's not super drag efficient. Um, it's just an alternative route. Uh, it seems that they were on target for downforce anyway, uh, so there's no need for them to go any further down this route, but it's just something that's worth keeping in mind. Moving a bit along the car, I think something that's worth noting is this particular mirror design. They're promoted as quote unquote F1 style mirrors, uh, and they are not dissimilar to mirrors, mirror housing shapes that you see on a lot of F1 cars. Uh, basically what happens is that if you have a look uh, this black portion on the outside uh, is like a separate shell from the, the orange portion on the inside. So if I was to draw this from side view, you've got the back of the mirror there and then you've got the, the central shell, that's the orange bit there. And then if I've sectioned it, you've got your mirror housing, the black bit that looks like that. Uh, now the intent of this is that the airflow comes on the front and that the, the air sort of comes around here and then the idea is, is that you can use the, this fairing and housing to shrink the wake and, and by shrinking the mirror wake with this particular housing uh, you reduce the drag and you reduce the effect of the wake on downstream elements such as the rear wing which if you have a look at this mirror position you'll see that the mirror wake is almost going to directly run into that rear wing as it moves downstream so anything you can do to reduce the mirror wake size, uh, and if you have a look, they've done detailing on the stalk as well, anything you can do to reduce that overall wake size is going to improve rear wing performance straight away. Behind the front wheels, like I mentioned earlier, well, we have a, a venting out section uh, that is presumably venting some of the front diffuser. Uh, again, as discussed previously, depending on what they're doing with the center section treatment and what they're doing for coolers, there may be cooling air coming out here as well. Uh, I can't be 100% sure from images, but those are two potential options for this region. Obviously, the more air we vent out of here, the better our front end performance is going to be. So it's always worth trying to vent out air as much as possible. Whether or not this particular barge board is doing a lot in its current placement, I can't be 100% sure. It looks like it's an in-washing barge board, uh, but it may be in line with the rear of the tire. It's very hard to work out from these particular details. On the top of the wheel, we have some very subtle uh, venting. Now, normally you vent this region to, to drop a bit of the high pressure region between the bodywork and the tire um, to improve the, the overall downforce on the car. There are some consequences with this in terms of the, the losses coming out of the vents going and spilling down the car. These are, are fairly subtle details though. Uh, I can't imagine they're going to be making huge differences to the numbers. And I'm sure a lot of this sort of detailing, when you look at how tiny these vents are, is probably going more towards the styling and aesthetic side, uh, much like if you look at the, the way that this particular portion of the fender still exists and has a lip going, in fact, a little bit in the wrong way behind the tire, so it's, it's sticking out instead of pulling in. Um, so the details like that, I do think, are probably a bit more styling-based than they are pure aerodynamic function. Again, on the, the details that are probably styling based and going a, a bit further rearwards, looking at the rear of the shark fin, there's this random notch cut out along here where they've just cut four notches in. I can't imagine that this is having any positive aerodynamic impact. Uh, you would, generally speaking, just run a straight edge along there. Um, there doesn't seem to be any defined shedding edge. This would be making a counter-rotating vortex pair in your... I, I can't foresee a, a use for this particular style of notch. So I would have to assume that this is aesthetic. Uh, same thing with these rear wing slot notches along here, um, is that if you'll note that they're, they're just straight slots, they're, there's not any particular contour or shaping to them. 
um, and also the, the rear wing at the back is, is not super aggressive. If I switch to this shot, for example, you can see that it's a dual element wing. It's not anything too crazy. Like it, it looks quite reasonable, but it's not anything too hardcore. Uh, so there shouldn't need to be any special treatment you've got to do to keep the, the end plates attached or the wing element attached. Uh, so again, I would hazard a guess that those slots in the rear wing are largely for aesthetics. Transitioning onwards to the rear diffuser, um, this design is, is quite an interesting one. Um, you'll notice that there's, there's not much in the way of unnecessary detailing, much like the rest of the car. Um, and what we've got is we basically have the, the sort of tunnel design that I showed you earlier, um, that's same as the T50, but then what they've done is they've added this aggressive kick to the rearwards portion. So the regular T50 goes kind of like that. Um, the T50S goes like that and then kicks up again at the back. Perhaps a better shot to show you uh, is this one here, which you can see that it's got that really aggressive kick there. Now it, it is a very aggressive final departure angle. Um, it is an extremely aggressive departure angle, but the thing is, is that because it's, it's only just the very rearwards portion of the diffuser, it's not like the entire thing is running up at this angle, chances are that it's going to be okay. And one of the reasons I say this is that even if you did start to get a little bit of trailing edge separation along here, uh, it's not the end of the world uh, because you're probably still going to get some effective curvature of the flow through here, even if there's mild separation. And the other thing too is that if you have a look at what's uh, above it, just here, is that previously you just had a bluff bumper anyway, right? So that would have just been separated regardless. So you've definitely made an improvement by having a, a ramp that the air is probably going to stay attached to and just give you a last little bit of, of kick on the air as it's exiting the diffuser and improve overall suction. Now the center ramp does look perhaps a little bit too aggressive uh, when you have a look at how low this portion is and then how much volume expansion ratio there is in terms of the proportional heights of this above the ground versus the tunnel above the ground. Um, so with respect to that, I do think that that's probably going to be a bit separated, but again, we're not talking huge performance deltas uh, that are going to result from this being mildly separated. And I think overall, this assembly is going to yield more downforce than the stock T50 would, which in the end is what they're largely going for with this car. I mean, is there more they could have done in this area? I mean, probably they could have. There, there's probably more stuff they could have played around with lateral expansion, with getting this outboard, with doing some flap stuff and all that. Uh, but it sounds like they're, they're hitting their aero goals largely right. And there's, there's no fundamental issues with the aerodynamics on the car. There's just areas where they could have gone a little bit further. But like we said, if they already hit their target downforce, then it doesn't hugely matter. One last thing that I'd like to direct your attention to is just this small little detail in the diffuser here. Uh, if you have a look uh, at this little object down here, it's a bit hard to see at first, but when you have a close look, you'll see that there's what looks like a little vein in there. Now, as far as I can tell, what I think that is, is actually the, the rear lower wishbone. So the bit that connects the, the central uh, gearbox housing or, or the subframe uh, out to the upright, so it's part of the suspension. And then what they've done is they've obviously added this little upwashing fairing on it. And that's quite a neat little feature because obviously any upwash you produce with your suspension like that can go and support this aggressive kick at the rear because you've just got more upwash there, you're just helping everything out. And also this, this member will generate some local suction on it because it's also still quite close to the ground. So that's quite a neat little bit of detailing and it's something that I haven't really seen much uh, in a regular manufacturer's car. So that's really nice to see on the car. I get the feeling that underneath the car, there's probably gonna be some really interesting detailing towards the front as well that we just can't see in photos. Well, that's all for this analysis. I'm still planning on putting out that analysis video on the fan system of this car. Uh, so if you wanna see that video, be sure to comment below and let me know if that is something that you do want to see and I can go through and eventually whip that up. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more. Hit the notification bell to get the latest updates from the channel and hopefully I'll see you next time.